With six days until the Detroit Lions square off against the Rams in a rematch on Sunday night primetime, the Lions are obviously getting ready and prepared for the game. But one thing this podcaster has found out is that the defense has an Achilles heel that they absolutely must exploit. Stay tuned. What are we? What makes us what we are and what we're going to be? It's grit. It's what we started with last year, guys. It doesn't matter if you have one ass cheek and three toes. I will beat your ass. can definitely compete with, with, with the big dogs. 10, yes! 5, end zone, touchdown Detroit Lions. You guys, you guys are unbelievable, man. I, I'm telling you. We are driven by Detroit. Hello, Detroit Lions fans, and welcome on back to yet another episode of MCM Motor City Mania. I'm your host, David T. Pike, and as always, we're going to dive on in. My friends, I'm telling you this right now. If there is one thing I absolutely love more than anything else when it comes time for the regular season is that we can stop having conversations based in hyperbole. Stop having conversations based on hypotheticals. Stop having conversations based on guessing. Now we can actually start focusing a lot more on actual hard data. Now we can actually start focusing on true, actual information. Because when you're in preseason, you're in training camp, all that, you're basing everything off of reports, and you're basing everything off of, hey, this guy may or may not make it, whatever the case might be. Now that's all said and done. Now you're like, okay, it's full steam ahead. The games are almost here. Now we're dealing with like cold, hard facts. And for me, I love doing that because the facts don't lie. They're the truth, and you got to stand by them. So, I can say this right now. This entire week, and even going into the weekend, I have been spending an immense amount of time taking a look at the Rams. I've been looking at their roster. I've been looking at their depth chart. I've been looking at analytics. I've been looking at stats. And I can tell you this right now. I've already pointed out in a previous episode one thing that the Lions can absolutely and should exploit for the Rams' offense, and that's their weakened offensive line. Again, just a quick recap here. The Rams are coming into this game without their starting left tackle, and realistically, they don't really have a whole lot of options in backup for a left tackle. So whoever they decide to throw in is not going to be 100% prepared for that role. And they're not going to be in a natural spot. Then on top of that, the Rams starting center and starting right tackle are dealing with injuries. And have had to sit out the majority, if not the entirety, of training camp and preseason because of it. So even if they do decide to suit up, they're going to be rusty. They're going to be slow. And they're still not going to be at 100% strength. So yeah, the Lions absolutely should and I believe will exploit that. They're going to bring absolutely all the pressure they can to get to Jared, to get to <laughs> Matthew Stafford. Pardon me there. So that is one thing that the Lions absolutely must exploit on the Rams. But as I was saying, I have spent a lot more time taking a look at this and I found yet another weakness that the Lions can exploit Take advantage of, abuse, whatever word you'd like to use, but this time, it's on the Rams' defense. And specifically on the Rams' defense, what I'm referring to is the Rams' linebacking core. Now, let me explain where this is all going. First and foremost, I don't remember where I read this, but according to what I read, the Rams' new defensive coordinator, I believe that his, um, they're going to run, according to what I read, is a 3-3-5 concept which is obviously three down linemen, three linebackers, five defensive backs. So I was like, okay, based upon that information, I'm going to adjust what the information from the 3-4 depth chart that's on ESPN and say, okay, who's the weak side linebacker, who's the inside linebacker, and who's the strong side linebacker? When I take a look at that information, the starters, at least according to where I am looking at it, should be Byron Young at weak side, Christian Rosboom in the middle, and Jared Verse at the strong side. And Jared Verse is obviously a rookie. So, why exactly do I think the linebacking core of the Rams is particularly weak? Well, I'm going to tell you why. 
because the information, the data that I have been looking at pretty much tells me that they are not good either in coverage or in run defense. Let me show you exactly what I mean. For Byron Young and Rosboom, obviously we have to go back to where they were last year with the Rams in the NFL. For Jared Verse, obviously we can't do that because he's a rookie. So obviously we're going to be taking a look at his last year at FSU. So here's what I'm going to tell you. When you take a look at all three of those guys that I just mentioned, and you take a look at how they did in coverage in their respective positions last year, and the reason I'm saying that is because some of these guys may or may not have been you know, full-time linebackers. They might have been edge rushers but they're obviously going to play linebacker in this situation based upon the information that I have. But take a look at this. According to what I was able to find, Byron Young last year, for the position he played, he was tied 45th out of all other players in terms of coverage. Not exactly very good. Rosboom, as a linebacker, ranked 48th out of all linebackers last year. And Jared Verse, obviously as an edge rusher in FSU last year, he was ranked 505 out of all edge rushers in the NCAA in coverage last year. And that's out of 713 qualifying measurements. That right there ought to tell you something, folks. Um, The Rams linebacking core, they can't cover worth crap. And let's just further add insult to injury here. Um, Jared Verse, the first round draft pick that you know the Rams are going to have playing this outside linebacker role, obviously also as an edge, kind of, you know, playing both roles here. His ability to cover is going to be of paramount importance. But in FSU, not only last year, but the year prior to that, he only had 25 coverage snaps, folks. You now are throwing this guy out there where he's been primarily a hand down in the dirt kind of guy or just edge rushing pass rusher off the edge. And now you're going to have him going out there and, you know, part of his game is now going to have to be covering guys like Sam Laporta, Gibbs out of the backfield. Dude, that's going to be a hard task even for veteran linebackers. Jared Verse has virtually almost no experience in coverage and now he's got to deal with that. Plus, like I said, Young and Rosboom, They weren't very good last year at what they did either. So, if you already know where I'm going with this, this is a huge, huge problem for the Rams, you know, linebackers. But, it gets even worse. Again, I also said that the Rams linebackers are not good at run defense. So again, take a look at Young, Rosboom, and Verse. Same parameters that I did with the coverage. When you take a look at Young last year in the position that he played, he was tied 42nd out of all others in terms of run defense. Again, not good. Rosboom, whoo, horrible. Ranked 170th out of all linebackers in the freaking NFL last year. If I recall correctly, there was 177 linebackers that were rated last year. He was almost the worst linebacker in run defense last year, and he's the guy that's in the middle. And then Jared Verse, the first-round draft pick, his last year at FSU, out of all edge rushers, he was ranked 135 out of all edge rushers in run defense. Again, not good. What it tells me right here is that the linebacker's responsibility or ability to fulfill their responsibilities in run defense is going to be a nightmare. Because, obviously, these guys are not good in run defense. When you've got these bad of rankings and grades, that's horrible. And then when you put it in perspective with our offensive line, oh dear lord, it gets even worse. Let's just put this in perspective, folks. The Lions starting five offensive linemen. Decker, Glasgow, Ragnall, Zietler, and Sewell. In that order from left to right. Take a look at how they do in both pass protection and run protection. Starting from Decker, going all the way to the right with Sewell's. Decker is ranked 10th last year in pass pro. Glasgow was ranked 44th. Ragnow was ranked 6th. Zietler was ranked 2nd. And freaking Sewell was tied 14th. And that's in all of their perspective, you know, respective positions, whether it's tackle, guard, or center. That's for pass protection. In run protection, again, starting from left to right, Decker was ranked 27th, Glasgow was ranked 4th, Ragnow was ranked 1st, 
Zietler was tied 28th, and Sewell was ranked first. Okay, I'm not a mathematician, but I can tell you this right now. Our grades and our rankings are practically better across the board compared to what the freaking linebackers for the freaking, you know, Rams is. Now, obviously, the offensive line would have to deal with the defensive line first. But what I can tell you is this. When you are trying to set up run concepts, your offensive linemen often have to get to the second level so that way the runs can extend out past, you know, the first five yards. Well, if this is what you have for the linebackers and you're talking about our ability to be a run, a run stuffer, uh, sorry, a run team and how well we're able to run block, again, that is not a good situation for the Rams linebackers. It pretty much tells me this. Whether we're passing the ball or whether we're running the ball, we're going to be in pretty damn good shape. Now, obviously, passing the ball, that means we have to deal with pass rushers, which means there are three pass rushers primarily for the Rams in this case, which is obviously Kobe Turner, Byron Young, and Jared Verse. Now, obviously, Verse and Young are in the linebacking core, and they're most likely going to be the primary edge rushers. But Kobe Turner is a defensive lineman. So I decided to take a look at all of their pass rushing grades from last year. And I decided to take a look at where they ranked. For Kobe Turner, for defensive interior lineman, he was ranked 10th, actually. So he was actually pretty damn good. Byron Young last year was ranked 50th. And Jared Verse, in his last year at FSU, he was ranked 8th out of all edge rushers in the NCAA. So I was like, okay here, that's very interesting. How in the hell is Kobe Turner ranked 10th and how is Byron Young ranked 50th, but yet those two together last year had 17 sacks, and there's such a vast difference between how they performed. Is it possible that PFF is being, you know, skewed in their grading? I'm not going to deny it. It is possible. But then I started thinking about something here, folks. My question is this. Like I said, Kobe Turner and Byron Young both last year had 17 sacks, right? But how much of their success is actually from their success versus being a benefactor from Aaron Donald? Think about this, folks. Last year, Turner and Young were both rookies. And obviously, Aaron Donald was there. Is it quite possible that with Aaron Donald being there and Aaron Donald being the player that he was, having to constantly be double teamed, allowed opportunities for Turner and Young to make those sacks because if you go to last year, Aaron Donald only had eight sacks. That's rather low for a player of his stature. And the fact that Kobe Turner and Byron Young together had 17, that tells me that the sacks that Donald wasn't getting, he was getting those opportunities to somebody else by the fact that he was getting double teamed. Now, obviously, when you take a look at those two players and how they did in college, Byron Young, when he was in college, he only had 12 and a half sacks in the last two years, which is okay. But when you take a look at his grades in college, as far as being a pass rusher, they were average at best. They weren't anywhere close to elite. Then when you take a look at Kobe Turner, he spent four years at a smaller NCAA Division I college called Richmond before he transferred to Wake Forest. And in college, he was definitely a solid pass rusher. But again, my question is this. He was at a small Division I college in Richmond. Then he went to Wake Forest, which, while Wake Forest is bigger... They're definitely not an upper echelon program. So my question is, okay here, how actually good is he because of the lack of comp competition he had to deal with? Regardless of whether or not those questions can be answered, the point remains the same. Because of how good Donald was, he was regularly having to be required to be double teamed, which meant that there were going to be mismatches elsewhere, and that was going to mean there was availability for guys to make plays. Well, now that's gone. Aaron Donald's not there anymore. So guys like Turner and Young, who had that last year, they can't use that anymore. And I sincerely doubt they're going to find it as easy as it was last year because now it's not going to be a mismatch. You're going to typically have 1v1 matchups across the board. That's going to be a huge, huge difference. So how does that play in to everything that's going on right now? Well... The reason why it can play into this is because I see an opportunity for exploitation on the Lions' part. And it evolves 
it, it involves and evolves from the Rams linebacking core. Again, like I said, all the Rams linebackers are horrible in coverage and they're not good in run defense. Now, Jared Verse, he's the wild card in this whole situation because there's no real tape on him from the NFL. He didn't play in preseason. He didn't really do anything there. But obviously, we know he was the best edge rusher coming out of college. So, okay, that right there means that he's going to pose a little bit of a problem because we don't really know what the hell he's going to do. We don't know his tendencies. But if there's one thing I'm confident of, I'm pretty confident that either Taylor Decker or Panay Sewell will be able to handle him. It's just going to be a little bit weirder because, okay, we don't have really good established film of him in the NFL. We're going to have to go back to his college days, which college and NFL does not always translate when it comes to the film room. But regardless of that point, the Lions can still take advantage of the Rams linebackers when it comes to their terrible coverage abilities. And the way they're going to do it is by play-action passing, folks. Again, I'm going to say this right now. The Rams already know that the Lions are going to try and run the ball. First and foremost, Dan Campbell is part of that old-school style mindset. He wants to run the ball. He wants to pound the rock. Well, I'm going to say this. The Lions would absolutely be foolish not to run the ball because, one, the Rams no longer have Aaron Donald, but the Rams also foolishly, in my opinion, traded away their best run-defending linebacker in Ernest Jones to the Titans. So it's like, okay, you got rid of your best interior linebacker. Now he's being replaced by a guy that's not so very good. So your ability to stop running in the middle is pretty much now almost nil. So for me, that means the linebackers for the Rams, in order to try and have a better chance of stopping that, they're going to start creeping up because they want to be closer to the line to try and have an ability to stop running plays before they even get started. But when you have play action, that poses a huge risk for linebackers because now they're out of position. And wouldn't you happen to know it, the Lions have the best play action quarterback in the entirety of the damn NFL, Jared Goff. Again, I have said this before and I'll say it again. Jared Goff is the best quarterback in the NFL by far when it comes to play-action passing, and the stats prove it. You go back to 2022, Jared Goff had the 8th best completion percentage off of play-action passing, the 4th most yards off of play-action passing, and he was number 1 in touchdowns off of play-action passing and passer rating for play-action passing. And then, again, when we translate over to 2023, virtually the same thing. He was 10th in uh, you know, passer, uh, passing completion off of play action, 2nd for yards, 4th for touchdowns, and 5th for passer rating, all off of play action. The man is an absolute wizard, a surgical surge. He's just perfect, almost damn lethal when it comes to freaking play action passing. Well, taking that thought concept and putting it back to the Rams linebackers, like I said, the fact that we have David Montgomery and we have Jameer Gibbs in the backfield, they're going to want to try and stop those two from even getting started. Well, if they're already out of position because they're biting so hard on the run, now Jared Goff has a wide open middle of the field. Oh, what's one thing we know about Jared Goff? He loves taking shots in the middle of the field. And who's going to be most likely in the middle of the field based off of the play action concepts that we have? Amon Ross St. Brown and Sam Laporta. And I'm telling you this right now, those guys can have a devastating effect on defenses even if they're being covered. But if they're wide ass open, <laughs> forget it. That's the whole point here. If you've got linebackers that can't even cover if they are in position, but they're trying to stop the run from even starting and then are out of position and then trying to cover, good freaking luck trying to stop Amon Ross St. Brown and Sam Laporta. You ain't going to catch them. Amon Ross St. Brown is by far a top 10, near top 5 wide receiver. And Sam Laporta is easily top 5, almost top 3 at tight end. And then you still haven't even factored in, oh, that's right, you're going to have Jamison Williams out there running around, Khalif Raymond, and Jameer Gibbs. So you've got three speed demons, plus you've got those two. So, okay here, how do you try to plan to stop that? That's my whole point here. These linebackers are going to be stressed and strained trying to keep up with all this stuff. Because if Gibbs comes out of the backfield, somebody's got to cover him. Somebody's got to drop down into the flat, whether it's a linebacker or a cornerback. 
Then at that point, it now means, hey, you've got a wide receiver with a safety over top. Hey, Jared Goff would take a deep shot. If you go back to the play action game, hey, like I said, the linebackers, you know, they decide to creep up, they bite. Now you've got an open field in the middle. You can throw it to Amon Ross St. Brown, Sam Laporta, Jamison Williams, whoever the hell you want. That's why I'm saying because of the weakness that the linebacking core is at, there is a massive opportunity for the Lions to take advantage of the situation, whether it's running the ball, whether it's play action, whatever have you. Their linebacking core is in such bad condition when it comes to being able to stop the run or in terms of pass coverage that it's ridiculous. Now, I will say this. Like I said, Jared Verse, he is the wild card in this. We don't know exactly what he's going to do once he hits the field Sunday night. But I'd be willing to bet you this. I don't know too many rookies that come out and have a standout performance in their very first game. And especially in an atmosphere like Detroit and especially against a team like Detroit. Because again, it's not like you know the Rams are going up against, say, you know, like the Cardinals or the Panthers, and you know it's a ho-dunk team. They're going up against the Lions, a Super Bowl contending team, a top five roster team. So unless your players are all on the same, play, the same page and are playing at top of their level, you're going to be hard-pressed trying to stop us, which means perfect opportunity to continually exploit and abuse weaknesses, which I'm telling you this right now, the Lions, Jared Goff, Ben Johnson, a lot of them, they are going to recognize this, and I guarantee you, it is definitely in the game plan to do as much play action passing as possible, because that is what Jared Goff is the best at, and our offense can run the ball almost as good as anybody in the league, if not better than anybody in the league. So for me, like I was talking about the offensive line in my previous video, this is another Achilles heel for the Rams that the Lions must absolutely exploit at all costs. Find a way to take advantage of this and make the Rams suffer for it. But anyway, I feel as if I've done a pretty good job of explaining my viewpoint, taking a look at the evidence, presenting that, and, you know, setting up my whole argument. So having said that, I'm going to end the episode and say thank you all for watching in another episode of MCM Motor City Mania. If you like what you saw, by all means, I highly encourage you all to watch the next episode. Also encourage you all to do one of these three things. Like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. If by chance you subscribed in the past and you forgot to do so at the time, or you just subscribed and you not yet had a chance to do so, again, I want to highly encourage you all to subscribe first. But also after you do that, make sure you hit that bell notification icon as well, so that way you guys never miss any more content that I push out. I also want to encourage y'all, please, share this content with your Lions friends and family members. Share it here on YouTube, share it on Twitter, share it on Facebook, share it anywhere and everywhere you can with everybody and anybody that you can. The more we can share it, the greater the channel has a reach on YouTube, the greater we're able to just spread it out and bring in more community members, and the better chance we also have to grow the channel. And with that being said to everybody, I hope you all enjoyed the content. And whether you are a first-time viewer or you've been here forever, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you all got something in your life that makes you happy, makes you smile. God bless, my friends. And until the next time we meet, I'll see you all in the next episode.